Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight and to see so many familiar faces. And it's also a great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Walter Zev Feldman. Uh, as we know, achieving a leading reputation in, in any scholarly area is a great achievement. That Zev has achieved this in at least two fields with major field-changing books is a testament to his intellectual brilliance and originality. His music of the Ottoman court, Makam composition, and the early Ottoman instrumental repertoire, published in 1996, established him as a leading figure in the area of Turkish music. And Klezmer, Music History and Memory, published by Oxford University Press in 2016, is already a classic. He has followed up both volumes with others, either complete or in progress. The, the book From Rumi to the Whirling Dervishes, Music, Poetry, and Mysticism in the Ottoman Empire was published by the Edinburgh University Press in 2022. And two volumes, From the Bronx to the Bosphorus, Klezmer and Other Displaced Music of New York, and The Elusive Klezmer, Rediscovering a Musical Language of the East European Jews are, are both in progress. Uh, in addition to this, he's written many important scholarly articles in both fields, as well as book reviews, CD commentaries, and has lectured widely around North America, Europe, and the Middle East. Professor Feldman received his PhD from Columbia University in Central Asian languages with a dissertation on the Uzbek oral epic. He has taught at Princeton the University of Pennsylvania, bar -Ilan University, and New York University, as well as serving as a professor at NYU's Abu Dhabi campus, and he is academic director of the Klezmer Institute. Zev has organized many workshops and concerts and is one of the only figures in the field of musical scholarship who deals with dance, gesture, and instrumental performance on the basis of deeply researched historical work and ethnographies. He's received support for his work from such organizations as the National Endowment for the Humanities, the US Department of Education, the American Research Institute in Turkey, the Litauer Foundation, the NYUAD Research Fund, and the Oxford Seminar in Advanced Jewish Studies. In fact, it is not only this combination of experience and skills that marks his work as special, but the manner in which depth and breadth are filtered through a deeply thoughtful process to produce works of striking authority and elegance. Particularly fascinating are his ideas about music and language developed through detailed historical study and backed up by a great deal of personal ethnography. Tonight, we will hear about some of his research in Central and Eastern Europe, particularly focusing on the region of the former Czechoslovakia. In his talk titled, The Klezmer Guild as Expression of the New Yiddish Culture Emanating from Bohemia to Poland, Lithuania in the 16th century, please give him a warm welcome. Well, um, the intro is maybe the most interesting part of the evening. So <laughs> difficult to live up to them. Can you hear me, by the way? Is my f mouth in the right place? What should I do? A little louder. What do you think? Better? 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 Okay. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I warn you, I'm a little bit sort of far from my core topics here in trying to go back in time all the way to the 16th century. I, mean, I do that kind of thing, of course, with my Ottoman Turkish research, where we actually have a, a few more sources to deal with. Whereas in the uh, Ashkenazi Jewish music, uh, again, as you'll see, uh, we have to piece together uh, various kinds of evidence uh, if we go back before the 18th century, certainly, for the, again, uh, the music we're talking about <clears throat> is what the Russians would call um, professional music of the oral tradition. I mean, Russian ethnomusicology is, uh, 
in some ways, uh, they, they focus on different things than we do in the English language ethnomusicology. And this phrase, the um, professional music of the oral tradition, is useful to understand uh, something which is related to the music of the folk, but which is not folk music. And many cultures in the world um, have this phenomenon. The, where I started my work, uh, uh, Turkic peoples, uh, this is very strong among all Turks, that every Turkic group uh, will have a distinction between the folk music of the people and the professional music of, based on the same principles, but professionalized. So uh, Ashkenazi Jews have the same kind of thing, except that for us, it's essentially uh, instrumental music. That we had this phenomenon that we're talking about here of the klezmer, as a professional musician working with principles coming from the music of the people. And in our case, this, this uh, klezmer profession has been going on for four centuries. So there's a lot of, uh, let's say, a lot of things that were developed musically in this time. <clears throat> and so I'll try to give you a little background. Um, the problem is that I've, because I'm dealing with time and space, I have no choice but to deal with history, ethnography, demography. I'd like to be able to get into music, but uh, it needs that kind of background. So, um, uh, actually, I have uh, I did publish a um, an issue of the journal Shofar. I edited that uh, two years ago, and there's an article of mine about ethnogenesis and musical re repertoires of the East European Jews. Because actually, uh, unfortunately, there's so much loose, loose talk and loose writing about Jews in general, about the history of Jews. Uh, it's, it's important to try to establish certain realities. And it's not easy because, um, you know, Jews are a diasporic nation. And if you go to a, a source like Anthony Smith, who was a great uh, sociologist of uh, the idea of the nation and uh, his book, The Ethnic Origin of Nations. Um, I mean, he looks at us, as the Jews, as one of the, probably the oldest diasporic nation. The next in line would be the Armenians. Uh, the point being groups that have the experience of having had a state, a kingdom, having had the formation of a nation in their earlier history, and then <clears throat> having lost their political autonomy and in time their, their territory, had enough uh, cultural, cultural means to be able to preserve their sense of nationhood for many, many centuries. Whereas most groups um, that lost their political autonomy disappear from history. There are many, numerous examples. Uh, Nabataeans, who are neighbors of the Armenians, gone. Syrians, Babylonians, Sumerians, that we know in our, you know, in ancient Jewish history, gone. So uh, it's a very peculiar thing that a group can maintain that sense of, uh, you know, of nationhood for, in our case, millennia. Uh, and it's important to know that since we're living in New York now, in America, and we read sources like the New York Times, where we have, uh, uh, the, the Jewish nation is never referred to, we do have is the Jewish religion. And there's a lot of confusion about what Judaism is. Judaism. I grew up in a Yiddish-speaking home and I went to yeshiva. I had no idea what Judaism was. Never heard the phrase, the, the word Judaism. And of course, uh, now I understand that this is coming from the... Uh, Judaism is coming from the Greek Judaismos, which was used by Flavius Josephus 2,000 years ago. And Judaismos was, the, um, was opposed to Hellenismos, Judaismos and Hellenismos, which is to say Hellenism and Judaism. These were not religions. These were ways of life and cultures. And he's describing the opposition of the Hellenistic way of life from the Judah, Jude, Judean way of life, which is Judaismos. Um, <clears throat> so, and uh, frankly, the Jews never really con developed the concept of religion as an independent category. It was always grouped with many other aspects of life, which we have in the Yiddish, um, you know, um, <coughs> Yiddish guide, 
which is Yiddishkeit is Judaismus. You know, it's not simply the Jewish religion. And uh, for Americans, it's important to be reminded <laughs> of this fundamental reality. So, um, so uh, I will try to avoid the temptation to go deeper into uh, to too much uh, theory of ethnography. But uh, I'll start here with a quote from my wife, uh, Judith Frigeshi, uh, where she wrote, uh, the desire of total fusion of all aspects of life in the realm of the sacred is a most original characteristic of East European Jewish culture. And that's really what a, part of the theme of what I'd like to speak about. Because taking a broad historical view, we might suggest that the acceptance of the Klezmer profession from uh, Prague to Krakow to Lvov and then further north and east was founded on the acceptance of the Yiddish language as the dominant Jewish vernacular. A keynote of this new expressive culture was a fusion of the secular, the religious, and the mystical by the Jewish society in general, and by the musicians in particular. So, <clears throat> uh, in this case, I'd say uh, ethnic history and culture, uh, cultural history are very much connected. So, uh, I, I have to Jump, jump a little bit into the ethnographic history here. Um, let's see, Let, maybe we can have a picture. Will I get a picture here? Yes. Okay, very nice picture, which will set the theme for what, something, what we're talking about. Um, this is from the 18th century, uh, done by a wonderful French artist who spent much of his life in Poland, working for the Polish aristocracy, um, de la Gordan, and much of his art is, some of his art talks, uh, depicts the Jewish life in the Polish-Lithuanian state as he knew it. But before I get to Poland-Lithuania, I just want to, um, let's say, to remind us I'm going to try to speak and not to read exclusively, but you'll forgive me. I will have to read certain, certain things here. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, Bohemia Moravia had one of the oldest and largest Jewish settlements anywhere in Europe, north of the Alps. The Jews there were pre-Ashkenazic and had spoken Czech for centuries. And if we go into the, uh, to Max Weinreich's history of the Yiddish language, he talks at some length, he writes at some length about the history of Jews in, uh, in the uh, Bohemian Moravian territories, which goes back at least to the 10th century AD. And it's, uh, as he wrote, uh, Western Canaan, Slavic Jewry, is an offshoot of Yavan, Greek Jewry. You see, and Jews of Yavan, that's to say Greece, followed the same route uh, uh, from uh, going from Byzantium to the lands of the Western Slavs, desiring to find better and new domiciles, uh, coupled with persecutions in Byzantium, which drove them from their old homes. And in addition, um, I should add that this had to do with the Byzantine attempt to convert the Moravian kingdom, which was the first Slavic kingdom in Europe, to Byzantine Christianity, sending Cyril and Methodius from Salonika this didn't work in the end, as you know, the Czechs became, the Moravians became Roman Catholics. But in the meanwhile, a lot of Jewish merchants took the same route, going from Byzantium, Salonika, to, uh, to the Czech lands. And we also know, thanks to the work of Dovid Katz, the Yiddishist, that um, there must have been Aramaic-speaking Jews coming as well from Anatolia through Byzantium up to the Czech lands. Uh, because uh, the interior of Anatolia, the, the Jews in that territory were still Aramaic speaking. And guess what? They still are. You know, there are still Jews who speak Aramaic as their, as their first language. And I remember meeting a Jewish gentleman in Istanbul who was from Van, and he said, um, well, you know, I'm a Sephardi, but I don't speak Ladino. I said, what do you speak? And he said, Anna makolam batargum. Right? I speak Targum. Targum is their word for Aramaic. So think of it. They've been speaking that for the last you know, 2,000 years or more. And that is why the Yiddish language 
has many colloquial Semiticisms. It's not all coming, this is David Katz's theory, and I totally agree with him, that it's not all coming from the Torah and the Talmud. There are a lot of expressions that, that come from a vernacular Semitic language, both from Hebrew and especially from Aramaic. And if you, if you speak Yiddish, your, your, your language is full of uh, these words. So, the next point is that I'm sure, as most of you know, um, well, maybe not most of you know, but uh, the, the Jews who, who ended up in the Czech lands spoke Czech, uh, which they called, the rabbis called the lang language of Canaan, Lashon Canaan. And uh, we don't go into why they called it Canaan, it's not very flattering, but they did. And uh, they wrote it in Hebrew script. They, there are rabbinic glosses with, with Czech, Judeo Czech. And the, probably for four centuries, the Jews had been Czech speaking. Then, as you know, the various German dynasties took over the Bohemian lands, the Luxembourg dynasty, eventually the Habsburgs, and many German speakers immigrated into the, uh, into the Czech lands, and eventually, since the Jews were urban, they had to, to learn German, and uh, in time, uh, they spoke both Middle High German and Czech, and after a few centuries, you got a fusion language that as uh, Max Weinreich would describe it, as a fusion, in which <coughs> Germ the Germanic and the, the Czech were the two major components with the Semitic. And um, uh, unlike earlier theories, including Weinreich's, now following Alexander Beider, for example, leading Yiddishist in Paris, we understand that the crucial area in this mixture was the Czech lands. The fusion language developed there. It was not the same as Judeo-German that had been spoken on the Rhineland, in the, in the Ashkenaz, per se. So, um, so we have this formation of the new fusion language, which was taking place in the 15th, 16th centuries in the Czech lands. And then we have to skip ahead for a second and look at what was happening further north, you know, because we had the Polish-Lithuanian state at that point further north. And um, something cataclysmic happened in 1495. And somehow, in Jewish history writing that we see in English, uh, rarely it's explained. We all know what happened in 1492, right? Where the, where the uh, Catholic rulers of Spain expelled the Jews. In 1495, the newly Catholic Grand Duke of, uh, of Lithuania expelled his Jews. Lithuania then extended all the way down to the Black Sea. This meant the Jews of Ukraine, the Jews of Belarus, were all expelled. Now, um, this is interesting, we, we don't have to get into why he did this, there are interesting theories about this, but uh, it was done. Jews went to the Crimea, other places where they took refuge. Uh, it seems the aristocracy, within eight years, they convinced the Grand Duke that this was not working that they need the Jews. <laughs> but in the meanwhile, most of the Jews who were expelled did not return. And in the early 16th century, there were two separate expulsions of the Jews from Prague. So there was every incentive for Bohemian Jews to go north, you know, to move over to Poland, Lithuania. And uh, there's, there's, again, as several recent historians of Jewish history pointed out, that there's no evidence for any large migration of Jews from the German territories into Poland, Lithuania. There is evidence for large migrations of Czech and Bohe no, Ch uh, Moravian Bohemian Jews. And uh, we know this even by the, the names. I mean, my mother's family's name from, uh, from Belarus is Gurevich, which is Horowitz, which is a, which is a Moravian town. Right. Many Jews have this name. There are, there's abundant evidence of rabbinic families coming from Bohemia, Moravia, into Poland, Lithuania. And um, of, course, of course, Hungary, the Jewish community, is almost to totally from Moravian and Bohemian origin. So, um, <clears throat> now, but when these Jews uh, came into Poland, Lithuania, uh, they were speaking Yiddish at this point. Now, the native Jews, in the, in the Lithuanian territories, were speaking another form of Canaan, which they called Rus. And Rus is the, is the ancestor of Ukrainian and uh, Belarusian. 
They wrote it in Hebrew characters, and we have glosses, rabbinic glosses in the Rus, not much in the Rus language. They seem to have spoken this at least since the 11th century, maybe even earlier, but certainly after the fall of the Khazarian Empire. The, there were lots of Jews, <laughs> it was not empty of Jews, and they spoke the Rus language, it would seem. Now, uh, in a relatively short time, in a couple of generations since they had been expelled, and even the ones who came back found themselves overwhelmed by the immigrants from Czechia, who were speaking Yiddish, what we would now call Yiddish. And so by the middle of the 16th century, we see that Yiddish becomes dominant in a very, very large territory in Poland, Lithuania. Now, what my, the main theme of my talk is to point out that this uh, movement, this, this um, let's say, the establishment of the Yiddish language, it meant that uh, there was now a new uh, transnational Jewish culture that was extending over a very large territory, the largest territory of any transnational Jewish group that was contiguous, and it meant uh, a new, new kinds of um, expressive culture were going to develop. And the very fact that it was such a large territory with a large population and a lot of communication back and forth um, uh, seemed to have accelerated this movement. And my, my thesis, my humble addition to this story, is that um, the fact that the um, Yiddish-speaking Jews in the Czech lands now had a professional class of musicians. This class originates sometime in the 16th century in the city of Prague, where the Jews are allowed to form guilds. And we must remember that in the German territories for centuries, Jews were forbidden to do any skilled work. They could not form their own guilds, they could not join the Christian guilds, they could not farm, they could not own land. <laughs> So what they had very limited uh, opportunities economically. Musicians were on a very low level. They were called leitzonim or naronim. Uh, they um, were a mixture of clown and, and dancer and singer. Uh, they went from village to village. They could not marry in most cases. They were too poor to marry. They had no lineages and certainly were not a guild. So that was the German Jews. Now suddenly in the 16th century, uh, Ashkenazi Jews in, in, in well, what we call Ashkenazi, Yiddish-speaking Jews in Poland, in, in sorry, in Bohemia, were allowed to form guilds of various kinds of guilds, but also musicians' guild, which they use the word klezmer, klezmer, and klezmer, as you know, is the Hebrew for uh, musical instrument, and uh, it's an honorific title. It's equivalent. It's its formation is similar to clay koidesh the holy vessels, which is the term for the rabbi and his assistants. So Klezemer was, uh, was an honorific title. And they had a monopoly, a chazuka in Yiddish, of playing at Jewish weddings. Nobody else could play at a Jewish wedding. And they tended to um, form lineages. They married among themselves, and so they, you know, if your father was a klezmer, you would be a klezmer. And uh, there was no doubt big social differences among the different klezmer groups, but potentially one could do very well as a klezmer, <laughs> because if you, a skilled klezmer could also play for the Gentile aristocracy, which was very remunerative, you could play for wealthier Jews. Um, <clears throat> so we have to also forget of our American associations with klezmer, which tends to be you know, very low class, uh, because there was no real understanding of what klezmer was in this country. No, so, um, yes, Jews. Now, what we see here is uh, uh, a picture of a klezmer group. Here they're playing for apparently non-Jewish people at home. And typically, the two typical instruments here are the violin and the cymbalum, the hammer dulcimer. And uh, the typical klezmer ensemble, since the, uh, certainly since the 17th century, was fixed. First violin, second violin, cymbalum, and bass. Sometimes there'd be a flute added. But we have records of the guilds that this, these were the instruments. And this continued in this form uh, up until the middle of the 19th century. 
So when I can just my personal experience, I had the privilege of spending a year interviewing Yermia Heschelis, who was a great Yiddish poet and also a Kapellmeister, first violin in the Klezmer Ensemble from Eastern Galicia. And since he is a poet, he was an extremely articulate and humorous man. And uh, inspired by him, I, uh, I interviewed him, I played, I'm a cymbal player, so I played my cymbal for him numerous occasions. And I was inspired to form a klezmer ensemble like the one that he played in Galicia, which is this, this kind of thing with first violin, second violin, there's no second violin here, but, uh, and cymbal. So, which we called Chervisa, which is a term that he used. It's klezmer language. It really means the Torah study group. But among the klezmorim, it meant the klezmer ensemble. So, um, yeah. Now, this ensemble uh, reproduced itself for many generations over a huge territory. Um, and we, we don't know exactly, uh, we can't know, because the Jews did not produce many notated documents. We have really nothing until the 18th century. It's interesting that, for example, we have a record of um, um, the, the Klezmorim in, in Moravia, which was based on Christian sources. And I'm uh, reading an English translation of this Czech article. And the, the author found a statement that in the middle of the 18th century, a Jewish cymbal player was rejected from performing in the Klezmer Ensemble because his teacher had been a Christian. And they, they said uh, he played in a Christian and not in a Jewish style. So in the mid-18th century in Moravia, it, everybody knew, all musicians knew, there was such a thing as a Jewish style. Right? Which is, means intonatia, which means an approach to rhythm, an approach to tempo, an approach to ornamentation and phrasing that was different from how the Christians played. And of course, under this, under this statement, there's a world of musical reality that we don't you know, have access to. But um, uh, we know that certainly by the 18th century, uh, the, the music of the klezmer was, was totally distinct from anything in any environment. And uh, again, my research has to be with more uh, recent times, of course, where we you know, actually have music. But, uh, sorry, uh, from the repertoire that we have, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, I would say that what I see in this music are four basic components. <coughs> and they're, they're, they're there in some, in some form in all the repertoires we know. There's an element coming from Jewish prayer, from Davenin, which is very important in uh, every Klezmer repertoire. There's an element coming from Renaissance dance, an element coming from Baroque dance, which is larger because it's more recent, an element coming from Ottoman Turkish music. And uh, Ottoman Turkish music of two social strata. A higher strata coming from the official music of the Ottoman state, the Mehter, and a lower strata coming from uh, dance music from Istanbul and the Balkans. And we find this among the Klezmer, the Klezmer documents everywhere. And uh, Locus Classicus is uh, the uh, manuscript of Aaron Beer from Berlin, an 18th century German cantor, a chazan who composed klezmer pieces. And I should mention, many cantors composed klezmer pieces. In America, we think of the chazan as a totally different character. He, you know, he's a clergyman, whereas the klezmer is Nebuchadnezzar, wandering musician. In Europe, it wasn't like that. There were some klezmorim who played for the aristocracy who were doing much better than many of the cantors, often even in the same shtetl. So that being a chazan didn't guarantee you were going to have a very high standard of living. And uh, although sometimes it did. And uh, we know there are manuscripts where we see uh, chazanim who were amateur klezmorim. For their own pleasure, they played violin and they composed klezmer pieces. One of them was the German cantor, Aaron Beer. And uh, Beer says that he learned some of his skill from a, a klezmer. We don't know if he was Czech or Polish klezmer. But in Beer's repertoire, he was composing Turkish music in the uh, klezmer style, which has elements of the Baroque and Ashkenazic prayer, as well as the Turkish makams and Turkish rhythmic cycles. So I hope to be able to do a study of some of Beer's 
years music, but it's uh, it's typical. It's not. Uh, it shouldn't be seen as exceptional. And even in Prague, we know in the same year when Beer completed his manuscript, 1791, the uh, Prague Klezmorum were asked to perform Turkish music for the Bohemian ruler when he visited Prague. So in 1791, it was understood that the uh, Czech Klezmorum knew something about Turkish music. What's striking is the total absence of local music. The local non-Jewish music was of no, of no interest to the Jews, and certainly not to the Klezmorum. So um, we see elements coming from the West, coming from the East, and coming from the Jewish prayer. That's what the music was about. And here we see a rather meditative scene where they're playing apparently non-dance music for the non-Jewish audience. Let me just play you an example of um, one of the few examples we have of Renaissance dance as it was transformed in the Klezmer repertoire, which is from the, uh, one of the manuscripts that our, our friend Kislogov had collected. Uh, and it was so old that it was just written as Alta Yiddish Tanz, old Jewish dance, because in the late 19th century, nobody knew how to dance this anymore. This was not any kind of dance that the Jews would know. So let me try to get a hold of it. And this is Chavrisa trying to play this melody. Uh, I'll take it a short dance. I won't be able to illustrate all the elements in the repertoire, it would take too long, but this is one, the, the, the Renaissance element. So again, the, the Yiddish-speaking Jews had this cultural memory of their connection with Western Europe, a connection with the Middle East, with the Turks, and their own music of prayer. I'll go in a second to the music of prayer, because, uh, as you did mention at the very beginning, the, the um, Jewish, East European Jewish culture has this coexistence of the spiritual and the, and the secular. And the klezmer, of course, was a mediator between these poles. Uh, now, from the very beginning, uh, I would stress that this, let's say, the mystical element in the uh, klezmer repertoire obviously was augmented by the Hasidic movement in the 18th century. This everybody would understand, where the Ashkenazim developed a mystical music. Mystical music is a very special concept, and I deal with it a lot in my study of Turkish music, because in Muslim cultures, they almost always have a separate category of mystical music connected with the Sufi orders. And we Ashkenazim have that as well. According to Moshe Idel, who's a leading scholar of, of Hasidism, it could very well have had to do with contact between Sufis and Ashkenazim in the Moldavian Polish border territories when the when the Baal Shem was alive. But even without that, I should mention that uh, Prague, Bohemia, was an important center of, of mysticism. It was a center of Kabbalah as early as the 15th century. And this was very unusual for Northern Europe. The centers of Kabbalah were usually in the Mediterranean areas and the Middle East. And Prague always had this continued connection with the East. 
it, it never really stopped. And so we have a figure like Avigdor Kara, who died in the 1430s in Prague, who was a famous Kabbalist. And whatever was happening in Sfat, for example, with the Kabbalists there, the Prague Jews were aware, the Prague rabbis were aware. And among these customs were the use of music during the, the, before the Sabbath and after the Sabbath. And what you, it's striking that we have this custom of the klezmorim playing in Prague before Shabbos, before the Sabbath, and in a tombstone from the Prague Jewish Cemetery from the 1660s, we see here, here rests the bottle of mana, Avram Klezmer. He too was a member of the Musicians Guild, says uh, Kata Zamarim, the Musicians Guild, that always appears in the synagogue at the beginning of the Sabbath. Now, this, this, uh, now we, to understand what this might, might mean, uh, we get, should re remember that for, this, for the Kabbalists, Sabbath was a mystical uh, time when the, uh, the, when the um, female element of the divinity, the Shekhinah, would unite with the male. And uh, uh, Moshe Idel here summarizes a Kabbalistic text from the 1570s where she says, the Shekhinah is called Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, because she is made of this song or because she receives all songs. The feminine divine attribute is adorned by the ascending songs and she herself ascends to sexually unite with the male divine potency, the Sefirah of Tif Eret. So this is, of course, the background of what Shabbat meant to Kabbalists. And uh, I, I would go off on a limb now and suggest that what we see in the uh, Klezmer repertoire uh, is there is strong connections between Shabbos, the structure of Shabbos hymns, uh, which may go back as far as the 18th century and somewhat later, and uh, certain kinds of Hasidic Nagunim and the standard Klezmer repertoire for the wedding which are heavily connected with, with uh, the, the, the Nusach of prayer. So to give you, and again, I, I believe the background of this is not only Hasidic, I believe it's coming with the Klezmer Guild, as we see from this tombstone from Prague, that the Klez, Klezmer families had inherited this tradition of understanding a mystical meaning in the Shabbat, and therefore the Shabbat as a wedding. And so, Further than that, every wedding has a mystical meaning, even the earthly wedding. So, um, so I'll just give you, an, and it happens in terms of musical form, musical structure. The Ashkenazim everywhere in Eastern Europe see the wedding repertoire as being based on the Ionic rhythm. Dom, dom, bam, 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 which was very popular in Czechia in the, in the 15th century and 16th century. There were many hymns, Protestant hymns in this structure, and then was adopted by the Poles. It became the rhythm of the aristocratic Polonaise. And I don't know, there's no way we can know whether the Klezmorum had adopted this structure from the Czechs or whether it came later from the Poles, or both are also possible. But, <clears throat> let me just drink something. I'll give you two music examples. One I'll have to sing, and the other I'll play on the recording. One is a mid-18th century Hasidic um, Zemer for Shabbos, which is uh, talking about uh, basically the, the unity, the unification, which is the whole subtext of the Sabbath. And he talks about Mia Chedes, it's the thing which, which unites. And uh, the, musical, the music goes like so. Meshoch <clears throat> no Ay, 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 le'am vakishe ritzonecha, ay, 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 
Kodeshem Bekudusha Shashabos Ai 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 Now, let me compare this with um, a recording of a Gosnigan from the wedding, a ceremonial klezmer melody from the wedding. And this we got from the Beregovsky collection and uh, from Bar Kagan. And this is Chervisa playing it. But I'll say this, that this particular tune I had, uh, I worked with Yermia Heschelis on the phrasing. So let me try to find it. Yes, okay. I think this gives some idea of this mystical quality of, of the wedding music. Now, before closing, I would like to, sh well, I first I'll reach a little conclusion. I don't know. Okay. Um, now, Mike, Mike had mentioned, Mike Beckerman had mentioned something about gesture in introducing me, and this again is a crucial part of understanding the Jewish expressive culture. That uh, the, uh, hmm. the, first the Yiddish language is very much based on the use of hands and motions of the whole body in speaking, and uh, Jewish prayer is based on all sorts of gestures, musical gestures that are very idiosyncratic and very, um, let's say, improvised. And these things come together in the Jewish dance, especially the dance of the soloist, the tensor in Yiddish. And in Jewish dance culture, we had this hierarchy of dancers, that there were the dances that were done by the community, and there were dancers done as solos, or as competitive or communicative dances. And the... Um, the use of the of the expression with the hands was crucial for the soloist dance, 
and it's also a way to understand the klezmer melodies, to understand the gesture and the rhetoric within the melodies. These gestures in the Yiddish language are totally unlike anything in Northeastern Europe. Not like Polish, not like Russian, not like Ukrainian, not like Hungarian, not, no way, no way. And when I had the privilege of teaching Abu Dhabi, my students were mostly from the Arab countries, from India, from Africa. And we started off, I did a course called Gesture, and we started off reading about Yiddish gesture, because the, the primary research in gesture in any language was done for Yiddish a hundred years ago at Columbia University here. And uh, all my students very quickly understood that their gestures, whether in Persian, Arabic, Malayalam, Amharic, were deeply connected with Yiddish gesture. And which is one of the reasons why Ashkenazic Jews totally stood out in Eastern Europe as foreigners, in a sense, and as not natives. No matter how many centuries we've been living there, but the whole way we communicated was completely different. And uh, I can see this even today when I, <laughs> when I was in Russia, you know, that I can almost spot a Jew <laughs> even speaking Russian, but I can see the movement and the gestures. So, unfortunately, this was very poorly transmitted in America. I'd say the immigrants were, their children were ashamed of it, were afraid of it, you know, and didn't want it to be well known. So, uh, I'll just, well, I think it's late for me to do much demonstrating. Demonstrating, demonstrating. Well, okay, this, uh, I'll do, my excuse will be that, that the, the, um, the term, the, the only word in the Czech language that survives in the Klezmer lexicon is skočna. And skočna is a Czech word originally, trying to do a kind of jumping dance, kakat in Slavic is to leap or jump. But in, uh, in the Klezmer language, it meant a special tune where the melody is jumping <laughs> around. And uh, it was more sophisticated. And eventually this term became a Klezmer word that most Jews didn't even understand anymore, what Skochna was. But um, uh, I've gradually understood what makes a tune a Skochna, and my, or my colleague Christina Crowther and I have discussed a great deal about Skochna as a state of mind. <laughs> so it was something very characteristic of the Jewish uh, culture, and it connected also with dance. So I'll just give you a brief uh, sense of this. Uh, with a tune recorded by Schlemke Beckerman, the great clarinetist from, uh, from, uh, from Ukraine, in New York in the 20s. And uh, I'll just give you a sense of what this kind of Skochna dancing might look like. Let me try to find him. Hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, these are not, I don't have the right shoes for this, but I'll do my best.
Thank you. I think I'll stop it there. <laughs> That's my conclusion. So uh, now we'll take some questions and we'll see if Professor Feldman is as light on his feet answering those questions as he was in presenting the dance. Uh, there's somebody, I believe, who has a microphone. Is that uh, the case? Yeah. And OK, so let's take this question over here. You mentioned that the Polish and Lithuanian Jews may have had Czech ancestry instead of German. Uh, is that oh, correct? Oh, for sure, for yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. okay now uh, the, my question to you is uh, a different question is, um, can we say that Germany and Eastern Europe were one civilization when it comes to religious ritual? Among the Jews, you mean? Yeah, in other words, when I see the, I think it's Oppenheimer, I forget his name, uh, uh, pictures of, of their rituals, it's almost the same as the Eastern Jews. Oh, there was, yeah, there was lots of communication, in a sense. Uh, <clears throat> but communication is not the sense as mass migration, not the same as mass migration. And both uh, Shaul Stempfer and Alexander Beider make this point, that there's no record of mass migrations of Jews from the German territories into Poland, Lithuania. No. But rabbis sometimes, yes. You know, there was communication both ways coming from Czechia, coming from Poland West, coming from Germany East. And so in a sense, all the, um, let's say the north, north of the Alps communities were aware of each other. Uh, the question is that, hmm, uh, it becomes a more complex issue when we know that there were religious, major religious differences, uh, sorry, major linguistic differences. And that hasn't been properly addressed, actually, by the scholarship. So, but for sure, for example, the uh, uh, tradition of uh, paintings of uh, synagogues in Poland in the 18th century, this, there's some good scholarship about this, showing that they were aware of a miniature painting that was done in Germany centuries earlier. And in fact, the Polish Jews were very much valued the um, visual arts that, that had been developed by the Jews of Ashkenaz. Because the medieval uh, Jews in Poland, Lithuania did not have that, right? So, that, so in Poland, Lithuania, they would look to the machzorum that were brought over from Germany as, as a model. That's true. But uh, so again, there was a great deal of cultural communication but it's not simply the question of, of, of origin. And also in dance as well, for example, in the picture in the, in the flyer, we don't have it here, but you see in the back of the, of the Jewish inn, there's a, three people dancing a patch dance. They're clapping together. And that's a German dance. That's an archaic German dance, which the, all the Jews in Eastern Europe knew. So, yeah, so we might say Ashkenaz, as they said in, in the Yiddish language, the, the Polak, the Prager, and the Ashkenaz. Those are the three Poles. The Polak, Prager, Ashkenaz. They were all in communication for a very long time. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do we know whether in those days the, there were men and women dancing together? Let's say it's from, this, from the 16th century on. Uh, well, look, in general, uh, dancing together is, what do we mean by together? D did you see the picture in the flyer, by the way, or, or the flyer from the, it's not, a, not here. But there we have people doing patch dance, and they're Hasidic people, right? There's one woman and two men who are dancing at an inn on a Jewish occasion. And uh, patch dance is kosher because you don't touch. In the same way, the share, the share is a contra dance that came from 18th century or 17th century Germany into, to the Jews of Poland, Lithuania. And uh, again, most Jews would do it. Share was a contra dance, which meant you, you did certain couple formations and you switch couples and you did circle formations as well. And most Jews accepted that. 
Now the Hasidim came along and said, oh no, no that's, that's too much. And so in some cases, only men would do the share or only young girls would do the share in areas where the Hasidim were stronger. In general, we can see from the scholarship on Hasidism, uh, it, it tended to separate the genders more. That those, peop- those groups that accepted the Hasidic way of life separated more. But I should also add that the, the rabbinic restriction against kol isha, against the woman singing in public. Uh, I'd say we klezmorim had a lot to do with enforcing that <laughs> in Eastern Europe because once the klezmer took over the music of the wedding, it has effectively shut out the voices of the women. Because only with Ashkenazic Jews we have instrumental music dominating the wedding. It's a unique Ashkenaz phenomenon. Other cultures have women singing wedding songs. Not with us. <laughs> no. And if you look at the Shofar journal, uh, Ludmila Sholachova has a brilliant article about the wedding songs that were done before the wedding, after the wedding, but usually not during the wedding. Uh, so, yeah, so that's part of the answer to your question. So, commonly now you have mitzvah tants at uh, weddings, Hasidic weddings. Hasidic weddings, yeah. And so it's interesting because, of course, the music that you played earlier was reminiscent of that, which is Hungarian, a lot of Hungarian, uh, not only, but Hasidic weddings after the chuppah will have a mitzvah tantz, which will have a separate dancing with the bride. Yes. And so a lot of what you're talking about, culturally, language-wise, dance-wise, it's all put there, and the badchan who's on the chair entertaining while the mitzvah tans is happening. Yeah, so I didn't get it. Because it's a yeah. cross-cultural of everything you're saying. Yes. And each Hasidic group took its place and strand of its history, its ethna, its language, its music, its and Well, its actually, dance. Hasidic music has not been studied the way it deserves because it has the most localism of any of the East European Jewish musics, because the Rebbe's try to foster that separateness. Yeah. Yes, but I'm saying there are very separate traditions of Nagunim, because the, in the way that there is not in Yiddish song, but there is in Hasidic uh, Nigun, that are very, again, they have nothing to do with Gentile music, nothing to do with local, no. Like Lubavitch is very different from Bratslav, but it's not because Lubavitch is Belarusian, nothing to do with Belarusian music. It's a separate Jewish tradition that developed among the, the Lubavitch Hasidim. And the same with the Hungarian groups, who also haven't been. Say again? No, but the point is, yes, that's true. But the point is that the, the Rebbe's wanted to differentiate themselves. They wanted their groups to be different. Whereas uh, that's not true for other kinds of, of Jewish music in Eastern Europe. It's only true for the Hasidim. I wonder if you could uh, talk about the influence of another diaspora oh. group uh, that had certainly influence on Balkan and other Eastern European, and that's the Romani, who have origins in northern India and uh, many other influences. You didn't mention anything about that. I'm curious. Well, I... Because I, I hear it, but... Yeah. Well, that's another one of my subjects, actually. <laughs> so uh, the, there, that's a very local phenomenon, that only occurred in, in, in Moldova, historical Moldova, when the Ottoman Turks ruled that territory. And uh, I, again, my friend Christina and I had done research together uh, in, in Romania, Moldova. Um, inshallah, someday there'll be a book about this because we have a lot of material. But uh, the point is that only there where the, the Turks um, invited the Jews to come in, in the beginning of the 18th century, and the Klezmorum, with the other skilled Jews, they wanted skilled Jews to develop the economy, uh, they combined with the Roma, Lautar, professional musicians, but the Roma at that point were slaves. Yes, they were slaves, and the best job you could get as a Roma was to be a magician. Magicians, uh, sorry, musicians had much more freedom of movement than other Roma, and for the Roma, it was a big step upward for them to work with the Jews a big step upward socially. So, of course, the Roma were eager to work with the Klezmorum, and the Roma learned the Yiddish language, so that in those those territories, Yiddish was the professional language of music. You you had to speak Yiddish if you were... 
And for about 200 years, this was the situation. And remarkably, it continued until relatively recently. Uh, my, uh, my friend Vasile Kisalica in Moldova has been working on this uh, topic. So, yeah, but it's, it's only there, because only under the Turks you had a situation where the Jews and non-Jews could freely interact without interference for a long time. And they were able to continue this movement even after the Russians took that territory and, and the Romanians took it. Socially, this was already accepted. Oh, yes, I should, badly, I should also mention as a footnote, of course, in, in Bohemia itself, uh, once the Jews were emancipated at the end of the 18th century, very soon after, within a generation or two, the klezmer profession disappeared. So there is no you know, modern klezmer profession in, in Bohemia. There's nothing to research. There are no documents. I mean, there's no notations. Uh, there are uh, contemporary groups, like I think I have here. Yes, there's the wonderful group Letaitsi Rabin that started to study uh, klezmer music uh, about 15 years ago. They were my students in uh, Weimar. This record came out uh, 10, 10 years ago, 2013. And they're doing wonderful klezmer music with the traditional instrumentation of violin and cymbal and so forth. But the repertoire is almost entirely uh, Ukrainian Jewish repertoire because that was, was, was documented. Okay. I mean, yeah. I have a similar question. Um, I didn't know Jewish music growing up, uh, but I grew up with Roma music. And sometimes when I hear klezmer melodies or Roma melodies, I don't know which one is which. So uh, is there you know, this well, fusion the, propagated? Well, the, well, I guess I should mention, we have on the Klezmer Institute website, if you look up Klezmer Institute, there's an article of mine. Oh, yes, Christina is going to show you some things about the Institute. But I wrote an article some years ago published in Romania called Klezmer Tunes for the Christian Bride. Klezmer Tunes for the Christian Bride, because in, in our country, in Moldova, and I'll secret, I'm a Moldova, Moldavian on my father's side, uh, the, uh, the Christians learned our music. So therefore it became a, a minhag among the Orthodox Christians to play certain kinds of klezmer tunes at the Christian wedding. And the earliest document, which thanks to Christina I'd seen many years ago, was done in 1938 by Romanian sociologists in northern uh, Bessarabia and Bukovina, where the violinist was a Greek Orthodox priest who played chuset tunes for the bride. <laughs> right? So, and on the other hand, uh, our Jews liked the, the mixed uh, Jewish Romani music, and that's uh, my teacher, Dave Taras, studied in our shtetl, in Yadinitz, in Moldova, and uh, he brought, he was one of those who brought this mixed Moldavian gypsy Jewish style to America, and where it really came to dominate American classical music. Right? So it was a two way street. Where with the, with the, well, but I, what, in most of Europe, there was not. In music, absolutely not. And it's very important to understand this, that there's a generalized talk about gypsies and Jews, but it's not true for most of Europe. It may have been true in Hungary uh, in the 18th century. Uh, my wife has also collected some materials about this, where we see gypsies and Jews, klezmorum, were playing together when the Turks left, in this case. And the Jews were an important source for Western music for the native gypsies. But, and there's plenty of influence, actually, of Yiddish music upon the Modjura Nota and Hungarian music and some of the early Hasidic Nagudim. But this came to an end, as in Bohemia, when the Jews were emancipated. And so the classic profession died out, and there's just nothing, no more, nothing more to research. Yes, another question? Yeah, okay. Mike, Mike, Mike. Basically, my, my question was almost the same. The gypsy music, that's what we grew up with in Czechoslovakia, and the Jewish music. So are there any um, 
uh, did the gypsies learn basically the Jewish music or vice versa? Well, uh, again, we have so we have no evidence for the Jewish klezmer music from the from the Czech lands. It was, as far as I know, it was never notated, never documented, no continuity. But it's not impossible that at one point the gypsies had learned from the Jews and that it may have continued. I haven't studied the Roma music of, uh, of Czechia, uh, just as in Hungary there were situations in some places where uh, Roma gypsies were actually playing things for Jews and some things they learned from Jews in the past. So it's not impossible. In other words, Jews were active players in this, not just uh, absorbing. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Let's take this gentleman and then uh, somebody in back, please raise your hand. Okay, we'll get to you. Yeah. So I, I just, um, as, as, as a working klezmer musician, I just want to point out something that I think sometimes some of our perceptions of this relationship is colored a little bit by the way, it, it, and I, I say this with, of course, all respect to our, our mentor, uh, Professor Feldman. Um, in America, uh, these distinctions have been flattened a little bit. And I use as an example, as a, someone who plays klezmer music, having been hired specifically by Roma families to play klezmer music for Roma families. Yes. So that kind yes. of, now I think that's an interesting phenomenon, which I don't think is related to the experience that you're describing in terms of people who actually originated in the old Czechoslovakia, the former Czechoslovakia. But at the same time, I do think it maybe perhaps that experience perhaps might color our perceptions of that relationship. I will also point out that the very first time that I was hired to do it, mm -hmm. the irony of it is, and we had an excellent klezmer band, and Margot Leverett was playing clarinet, <laughs> oh, I was there, and, and we were playing, and we thought of, played every single klezmer tune we could think of. And at the end, yeah. they were very unhappy because they, what they wanted us to play was Hava Nagila, which, <laughs> which, which I, but I actually think that that's really interesting. But I, I do think that, that perhaps that experience that we see, you know, in, a, in the way that America often flattens these relationships, that maybe that has colored our perception of how well, that relationship worked. Actually, Jordan, it reminds me of a memory I have from way back in, in, uh, in Boston, where I bumped into a gypsy wedding, and sure enough, they were playing klezmer music. <laughs> so... Well... Interesting. There's a story here, I'm sure, that the Romani communities in the States have not been researched in the way that they might be. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, when did the clarinet and trumpet, how did it get into klezmer music? Uh, that came very late. In the, actually, you know, I have a picture here. Wait, picture. Can I get back to it? Um, there. In this picture, we see the, the old klezmer ensemble on the bottom with fiddles and cymbal, and then the slightly newer one, they're both, uh, um, this is from the, um, the, like in the late 19th century, you start having uh, the trumpets and the, uh, and the clarinet, and uh, uh, it, it drove out the cymbalum, this new kind of ensemble drove out the cymbalum, and unfortunately most of the recordings were done in a period, the early recordings, when this process had already taken place. So we have very few recordings of the old traditional Klezmer Ensemble. And again, my teacher, Yermia, well, my first teacher was Dave Taros, who was the leading Klezmer clarinetist. But my second teacher was Yermia Heschelis, who was a very traditional-minded violinist from Galicia. And he, he would tell me over and over again that in his part of, of Europe, the clarinet had a low status, even in his generation, <laughs> that, uh, that a real Klezmer Ensemble would have a violin as a leader and not a clarinet. In fact, one of the reasons he stopped playing klezmer music when he came to America, because he said in America the klezmer music was the hands for the, in the clarinetistin. <laughs> See? It had been clarineticized. <laughs> so you, you don't know why it, it worked its way in? Actually, there, we don't really know. We know when it happened, but we don't know why it happened. Some people theorize it's because in the Tsarist Empire, Jews had been um, forced into the army, you know, and that they might have been playing klezmer and were playing in the bands with the army. But there's no evidence to support this theory, really. So uh, I don't have an answer. Uh, yeah. I, I have a question um, that probably neither of us really knows the answer to, so you might ask why I ask it. But, um, 
you made a more or less categorical statement that uh, that local elements, to some extent, so local Czech elements, didn't make it into this repertoire, didn't make, become part of it, and and I wonder, sort of, um, I mean, it's it's difficult to ask about the mechanism by which something doesn't happen, but I'll ask you about it because you know, in, in every way, you assume that working musicians have ears; they're going to hear sounds, they're going to see movements, and even though if they don't incorporate all of them. Uh, it, so, what would be the mechanism through which they would completely ignore and and you know circle these elements and and in, in effect have to purge them from a repertoire? Well, Mike, uh, actually, if you mention Czechia, that situation is so old and it's so badly documented mm -hmm. that I wouldn't ex I, I wouldn't say this so categorically for that time. Although even there, I pointed to an 18th century document showing that, that the style stylic difference was clear. And the Klezmorum rejected this cymbal player because he studied with a Christian teacher, and they didn't want that. So, but everywhere else in the repertoires that we know from Ukraine, from Galicia, from Bessarabia, from Belarus, um, and I know something about the local music, so I'm in touch with, uh, with uh, Belarusian musicologists and others, uh, that you see an absolute, it's very strong division that the Klezmorum did not want those elements. The Jews did not want them they weren't interested. It's okay for them to play it for the Gentiles in an inn or a Gentile wedding, but not for us, thank you. And uh, again, I grew up in this kind of culture. That's how my father heard music. Very strict boundaries. What was in and what was out. Some non-Jewish things were in because we had a historical relationship. So for example, he loved Greek music. And the Greeks loved klezmer music. I mean, I was in a Greek band as a teenager. I remember walking into the Acropolis Hotel in the Catskills, and when I, when I came in, all the Greeks rose and said, Dave Taras, we love Dave Taras. <laughs> There's a historical connection between the Greek musicians and the Klezmer musicians. But there was not that in the Bel Belarusian musicians or the Ukrainian musicians, no. No. And by the way, Dave Taras was exactly the same. He had a very fixed idea of what was relevant to his music and what was irrelevant. So yes, Mike, actually to be Jewish, uh, one of the prime uh, skills you have to learn is to know what's irrelevant. <laughs> uh, okay, um, I, I'm still skeptical, but I, that's a wonderful way to end perhaps with uh, knowing what's irrelevant, but thank you for a wonderful lecture.